Last week we looked at a few new letters. We looked at the letter Bet and Gimel last week, and we introduced ourselves to the study of gematria, which is basically the idea that all Hebrew letters have a numerical equivalent, a numerical value, and we gave a number of examples of both gematriot and different uh, examples of how the actual Torah forms, the actual way the letters are laid out within words has tremendous meaning as well. Uh, I mentioned last week in passing a verse at the end of the book of Dvarim, at the end of Deuteronomy, where the Torah is speaking to the Jewish people about basically uh, their moral state, and uh, it's really a long sermon that Moses is giving. But in passing, he says to the Jewish people, Ki lo davar reik whom he came. That it's not a vein, it's not an empty thing from you. He's not speaking there about gematria, but it just turns out that the numerical value of this phrase is the word gematriot, numerical equivalence thereof. So the, the rabbis sort of tongue-in-cheek say, this is an interesting clue that gematria is not an empty science. It's actually a very valuable tool that we have for analyzing the Torah. The Vilna Gon points out something very interesting. We all know that there are certain special numbers in the Hebrew Bible and in Judaism. Uh, the number 40 comes up a lot, right? There are 40 years in the desert, and uh, 40 is often the number associated with the formation of uh, a fetus, and uh, 40 years is often a certain uh, basic stage of a person who's gone through uh, a, a big chunk of life. It's considered to be a significant, serious period, 40, and then 400 is another number. There are 400 people in the army. So 40 is a very popular number. 10, obviously, is uh, a, a, an important number. Many numbers are important, but uh, one of the numbers we all know that comes up many, many times in the Bible and in Judaism is the number seven, right? Uh, seven days of creation, seven days of the week, seven colors in the rainbow, seven notes at least in the Western musical scale, and uh, numerous other examples, seven years of Shemitah, the sabbatical years. So the Vilna Gon, we mentioned him in the past, the Vilna Gon was someone that it's hard to really get a grip on how well he knew the Torah. One of uh, his, his famous students was Ruchayim of Alojin. Rafaim of Elohim was the great protege, the great student of the Vilna Gon. And someone once remarked to Rafaim of Elohim, someone said, you know, that the Vilna Gon's brother, I think his name was Zalman, he said the Vilna Gon's brother also is a huge genius. He, he knows everything. He knows the whole Torah. So Rafaim of Elohim says it's true that Reb Zalman knows the entire Torah. He knows the entire Torah like most Jews, or like many Jews, know Ashrei. One of the psalms that we say every day in our prayers, three times a day, is Ashrei, Psalm 145. So if you've been saying it for many years, many people know it by heart. So Rav Chaim of Elohim said that, yes, Rav Zalman, the Vilna Gon's brother, he knows the entire Torah, everything in the Torah, like a regular Jew knows Ashrei. He knows every word. It's true. He said, but the Vilna Gon is different. Because he said, how many people can say Ashrei backwards? Meaning that that's how well he knows it. And I've been saying Ashrei for many, many years now. I know it by heart. I couldn't think about saying it backwards. I get tripped up very quickly. So the Vilna Gon had this grasp of the Torah, and uh, he was able to find incredible uh, patterns and numerical things. He, sa he found something that was very simple, actually. One of the things he noticed was that we, er, we eat certain kinds of foods on Shabbat. And he noticed that if you look at these special kinds of foods, they all have something in common. Look at the board behind me. So we have yayin. We drink wine on Shabbat. Yayin is yud, yud, nun. 10, 10, 50, which is 70. And we eat meat. It's custom to have meat on Shabbat. Basar v'dagim. We have meat and, and fish even. So basar... Beit is 2, Shin is 300, Reish is 200 for 502. And then Challah, we have Challah, of course, a special bread for Shabbat. Challah is Chet, 8, Lamed, 30, Hay, 5, total of 43. And Dag, fish, Dalit and Gimel is 7. Nair, we light candles on Shabbat, we don't eat them usually. 
Um, so Nair is 250, the Reish is 200, and then Nun is 50. And then Marak, we usually have soup Friday night. So Marak is Mem 40, Reish 200, Kuf 100 for 340. You look at all those numbers, and what they have in common is they reduce down to seven, right? If you add up all the digits, you come up with seven. So he found these kind of patterns literally all over the Torah, all over the Torah. This might be the, one of the simplest ones that he has introduced us to. The Torah tells us that, you know, there are basically three primary groups among the Jewish nation. There are the Kohanim, the priests. The priests come from a certain family within the Levite tribe, right? One of the 12 tribes were Levites, the Levites. And any descendant of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses, that person is a Kohen, a priest. So you have the priests, a small group, the Levites, a larger group, and then everyone else is called an Israelite. So in the Torah, Moses is told to separate, to take the Levites from among the Jewish people. Kach et halavim, kach et halavim, take the Levites mitoch, from the midst of, from the middle of, from the midst of Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel. So it's been noticed that if you take the word Yisrael, Israel, you're going to take the Levites from a month, from a month, from the midst of, from the midst of the children of Israel. Take this word Yisrael and spell out Yisrael, where you spell out each letter. Yud is Yud Vav Dalid, Shin, Resh, Aleph, Lamed. So you're spelling out each letter. And you'll notice that each letter is composed of three letters. So if you take the middle letter, meaning that we're going to choose the Levites from who? From the midst of the children of Israel. Take the word Israel, spell it out, and take the middle letter, you get a Vav in the Yud, a Yud from the Shin, a Yud from the Resh, a Lamed from the Aleph, and a Mem from the Lamed, and it spells out Le-vi-in. Levites. So you see that the Levites actually did come right from the middle of Yisrael, from the Jewish people. One of the things that our sages teach us, and actually if you read the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the five books of Moses, and you compare it carefully to other parts of the Bible, you'll often see that things are not exactly repeated in the same way. The book of Deuteronomy is to a great extent a repetition, a recapitulation of much of what happened in the first four books. One of the major stories in the book of Exodus is the revelation of the Torah at Mount Sinai, the giving of the ten dibrot, the aseret dibrot, the ten sayings, often called the ten commandments, which is a misnomer. There weren't only ten commandments. As a matter of fact, there was a time in Jewish history when reciting the ten commandments was actually part of the liturgy. In, in the synagogue services, they would actually recite as part of the services the Ten Commandments. And then about 2,000 years ago, the rabbis basically removed it from the service. You can imagine, you know, the rabbis taking Aleinu, right, and removing it from the prayer book today. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine. So the rabbis actually took the Ten Commandments out of the prayer service. They removed it 2,000 years ago. Why? We can really understand the reason, because if you go out onto the street and you ask the average person, fill in the blank, the blank commandments. How many commandments are there? Many people will say, Ten Commandments. That's what God gave. So that often happened, that also happened 2,000 years ago. People began to think in some ways that this was, this was it. That was it. Ten Commandments. And in order for people not to put too much emphasis on these Ten Commandments, forgetting that there are 613 commandments, the rabbi said, you know what, let's not focus so much on these ten. It's, it's not necessary to single them out for such special attention. Everything is important. So if you compare the first version of these ten statements in the book of Exodus to the second time around when they're repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, they're not always repeated in the same fashion. In one instance, the Bible says, Zachor et Yom HaShabbat, remember the Sabbath day. And in the other version, it says, Shamor et Yom HaShabbat, guard or protect the Sabbath day. 
One is to remember, and one is to guard or protect. So the rabbis teach, it's a famous statement of the rabbinic sages, that zachor v'shamor b'dibur echad ne'emru. That these statements were actually uttered simultaneously by God. Now if you want to try something that's very difficult, try saying two things at the exact same time. We, we can't even think that, that it's possible. It stretches our imagination. It's a total paradox. Yet, what the sages tell us is that these two versions of the Aseret HaDibro were said simultaneously. Somehow, God was able to project, and the Jewish people were able to hear, Shamor et Yom HaShabbat and Zachor et Yom HaShabbat. So I was at a home of a rabbi here in Toronto a number of years ago, and I saw on his wall was a beautiful little uh, plaque. And the plaque expressed visually this idea that shamor v'zachor b'dibor echad ne'emru, that the two expressions of the Shabbat were said simultaneously. This is what he had on his wall. He had this word which looks like shamor. I mean, shin, mem, the O sound doesn't even need a vav, but your eye can be fooled into thinking there's a mem here and there's a vav here. So here you have the word shamor, to guard. But as we learned previously, every Hebrew letter is constructed of other Hebrew letters. So you could take the shin and separate off the zion. The last part of the shin is a zion, so just remove these two parts and you'll see here a zion. The mem is composed of a chaf and a vav. So now you see not the word shamor, but if you look at it with a different kind of angle, you see the word zachor. So here visually, the idea of shamor, v'zachor, b'dibor, echad, ne'emru, they somehow came together in the very same expression. So this is a phrase that we've heard many, many times. This is a phrase that's probably uh, the, the primary mantra of Judaism. It comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Shema Yisrael, actually I spelt this wrong, it should be a resh, not a dalit. So Shema Yisrael, hard to translate by the way. Shema Yisrael, hear, listen, pay attention, pay attention, Jews, Listen up. Hashem Elokeinu, we discussed this last week, the two different names of God, the two primary different names of God, the Tetragrammaton, which is God's, we call it the Midat HaChesed, the God that we perceive as being imminent and close and loving and the Father and merciful, and then Elohim, which is the God that we perceive as strict and the King and the Judge, and almost not so much imminent, but transcendent. The, the Shema is telling us it's ech, Hashem Echad. It's one ultimately, totally loving, merciful God. That's the bottom line. In God's essence, that's why this is called the essential name of God. It describes God's essential nature, which is merciful and loving. It's just that sometimes we perceive that God as being strict. So one of the messages of the Shema is, listen Israel, there seems to be a duality, Hashem and Elokeinu. The message is Hashem Echad. Another way of reading this, Shema Yisrael, listen Israel to Hashem Elokeinu. It's telling us, listen to the Lord our God. The instruction is for us to pay attention to God. Listen to God. You know, want to know why? Because Hashem Echad. Because God is one, meaning God is the only reality. Nothing else really exists. And therefore, God is always speaking to us. Every single thing we hear or experience in life is a manifestation of God. So the instruction here is, listen very closely to God because Hashem Echad, because God is the only reality, everything that we experience is really a manifestation, a communication from God. There's nothing that we experience that's not really ultimately godly.
We take the letters of Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. We add up all of the letters. It comes out to, and I tried this at home, it comes out to 1,118. Add up all the letters, 1,118. In Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, we have a very famous teaching, Heve Dan et Kol HaAdam Lekaf Schut. The Biala Rebbe points out that this phrase, give every person the benefit of the doubt, judge every person to the scale of merit, that also adds up to 1,118, the exact same numerical value. The lesson might be that it's only a person that has a firm conviction that there's a God that runs the world, that that person has the emotional space, the ability to give people the benefit of the doubt. If you believe that there is no ultimate force and being that runs the world, then you might feel that you are compelled to make sure that you are not going to give anyone a break and you're going to be very protective of your life and you're going to sort of be strict in the way you judge people because I can't take any chances. I have to make sure that my interests are protected. The person that really believes as a God that runs the world really believes that God is really in charge. God is responsible for making sure that evil gets punished and virtue gets rewarded. It's not my job to play sheriff in the world. So one of the teachings of the Biala Rebbe is that if you really identify with the idea that there's God and it's one God that controls the whole world, I now have the emotional space to give other people the benefit of the doubt. But wait, there's more. The Zohar teaches that we have three names of God in the Shema. We have Hashem, which is the yud Ke vav Ke, or the yud He vav He, the Tetragrammaton, which speaks about God as was, is, and will be, Haya, Hove, and Yihye. So it's the four-letter name of God, which we saw added up to 26, yud He vav He. Then we have the name Elohim, and then we have again the yud He vav He. So the Zohar points out that in the Shema, there are three names of God that have a total of 14 letters. Three names of God, a total of 14 letters. This is a four-letter name of God, yud heh vav heh yud heh vav heh so four and four is eight, and elo Kenu really is the name Elohim. Elohim has, I'm sorry, Eloheinu, we're going to take all the letters, six letters in Eloheinu, which is six and eight is 14. So you have 14 letters in the three names of God in Shema Yisrael. We learned that 14 in Hebrew spells out the word yad, or hand, because there are 14 digits in the hand, right? Each of these fingers has three digits, that's 12, and the thumb has two, so that's a total of 14 joints, if you will. And 14 is the number of letters in the three names of God in Shema Yisrael. Anyone think of the connection between yad, hand, and Shema Yisrael? Well, when we say Shema Yisrael, what do we do? What's the custom? We put our hand over our eyes. We put our hand over our eyes. Something quite amazing. Each of the fingers on the hand has a name in Hebrew. They're written on the bottom of the page here. We already learned the first name. Bohain is thumb. Bohain is thumb. Etzba is the forefinger. Ama is the middle finger. Kamitsa is the fourth finger, and Zeret is the pinky. Take all of these names of the fingers, add up all the letters. Anyone want to guess what it adds up to? 1,118. 1,118. So we have on the page here three different examples of 1,118. In the Torah, we're told in the book of Exodus that one of the major projects, it's one of the central stories in the five books of Moses, is the construction of the tabernacle in the desert. 
the 25th chapter of Exodus, God tells Moses to tell the Jewish people to construct a sanctuary, the Asuli Mikdash, the Shachanti Betocham, and I'll dwell amongst the Jewish people, meaning I'll dwell in each and every Jewish person. That's where the real Mishkan is supposed to be, in our hearts. But we have a physical, national symbol of this presence of God called the Mishkan. The Torah says in Exodus 39, Exodus 39, verse 32, Vatechel kol avodat mishkan ohel moed, that there was completed. Vatechel, it's similar to the word vayechulu, that we say Friday nights, God completed the building, the, the formation of the world. So when we finished the construction of the mishkan, the Bible says vatechel kol avodat mishkan, there was concluded all of the work of the sanctuaries, ohel moed, tent of meeting. When was the work completed? When was the construction of the Mishkan completed? It's interesting that we know when it was erected. The Bible actually says that the Mishkan was erected, it was established, it was put up, meaning all the parts were completed. It was set up on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the first day of the first month. But it was actually completed. All the parts were built and finished months earlier. And the Pesikta tells us that it was completed on Chof Hei Kislev, on the 25th day of Kislev. What is that date famous for in Jewish history? That's the holiday of Hanukkah. So the holiday of Hanukkah, which took place many, many, many years later, echoed the actual completion of the construction of the Mishkan when the Jews left Egypt. One of the most amazing books on gematria. It's not only on gematria, but it's one of the major sources of gematria is a book, a commentary to the five books of Moses called the Baal Haturim. There was actually one of the earliest versions of the code of Jewish law was a commentary set up as really a, a, a code called the Tour by Rabbeinu Asher. And he also wrote this very unique commentary to the five books of Moses, which includes hundreds and hundreds of gematrias, of numerical analysis of the Bible. You actually have now a translation of five volumes of this put out by Art Scroll. Art Scroll actually has five volumes going through the entire commentary with extensive footnotes. One example of what he noticed was, and again, this is without the aid of computer programs, is that if you take this phrase from the Bible, Vatechel kol avoda mishkan, there was concluded all of the work of the mishkan, that equals numerically the value of the phrase, Be'esrim v'chamisha b'kislev nigmar. On the 25th day of Kislev, it was finished. The total number is 1392. That comes from the commentary of the Baal Haturim. This is a phrase that we've studied several times already over the past few weeks. You'll recognize, recognize it as the first verse in the Bible. I wrote it in sort of a strange way because I want you to focus on the first letter of each word. So we have again, Bereshit in the beginning, bara created, Elohim, God, et hashemayim, the heavens, ve'et ha'aretz, the earth. The first letter of each word, bet is two, Let's see if we can do this together in your heads. Bet is two, bet is two. Aleph is one, Aleph is one. Hey is five. Vav is six, Hey is five. For a total of 22. What is significant about the number 22? There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And we learned that according to the mystics, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet were the means by which God created the entire world. So again, in the first verse of the Bible, a clue, a hint that creation takes place through the alphabet, through the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Here we have on top of the page three words. This is not a Jewish tongue twister. Someone might have thought it was the only and the first tongue twister in the Hebrew Bible. 
So here we have three Hebrew words that sound similar. Nachash is snake. Nechoshet is copper. Copper. And Nichush is sorcery slash divination, some kind of occult practice, usually translated as sorcery. Now, what do these three words have in common? Is it just the fact that they sound similar? So one thing they have in common is they all appear very closely together in the Bible. They, they appear within just a chapter, a few chapters of each other in the book of Numbers. What happens is as follows. After traveling in the desert for a while, the Jewish people begin to complain. Not that Jews ever complain, but there was a story that happened that the Jews complained that there was not enough water, they didn't have water, and the bread was not so enjoyable. They spoke about this flimsy bread that they were eating, this sort of less than satisfying kind of food. They were complaining about, you know, the food. Like, you know, the person goes to the hotel or the restaurant and complains how lousy the food was and how small the portions were. So that's the kind of story we're talking about. That basically, they're complaining about their diet. What does God do? God, by this time, is a little bit uh, had enough of them. So he sends snakes to attack them, a plague of poisonous snakes. So that's the first word here, that the, the Nachashim, snakes come and start biting the complainers. The Jewish people take this to heart. They, they get the message. They realize, you know what, maybe our complaining and whining was not good. So they have a change of heart. They really do, a genuine change of heart. And they, they plead, Moses, please take the snakes away. Get rid of them. So what God does is God sends God tells Moses to construct a copper snake, a nachash hanechoshet, a copper snake, to put it on top of a pole. That's the symbol, by the way, for um, doctors. I'm not sure how many parts of the world, but it's the medical symbol, right? The snake on top of the pole. And basically what they're told is anyone who looks at this snake, if they were bitten by a snake that was poisonous, they will not die. Somehow looking at this copper snake is similar, I imagine, to the story of when Amalek attacked the Jewish people and Moses held his hands up. And whenever his hands were held up, the Jews were victorious. Whenever he put his hands down, the Jews were losing the battle. Obviously, this was not some magical charm. What the rabbis teach us is that when he raised his hands, the Jewish people looked heavenward. They put their faith in God. And then they were victorious in their battles. But as soon as Moses put his hands down, if they took their eyes off of God, they, took their, they, they lost their focus, then they would, not, they would not win the battle at that point. So again, the magical snake here is not a magical snake. By looking up at the snake, they're supposed to be looking heavenward. But also, we'll see in a few minutes that there may be a lesson in looking at the snake as well. Maybe we'll get to discuss that in a minute. But what is the third story? So right after this whole incident with the poisonous snakes and then the copper snake, we know that the Jewish people were almost cursed by a professional sorcerer, a great prophet of the non-Jewish peoples named Bilaam. Bilaam was hired to go and curse the Jewish people. And just as he was about to give his curses, God sort of forced him Almost, you know, he was speaking really not even willingly to bless the Jewish people. And this takes place in chapter 23 of Numbers. The, the brass, the copper snakes is chapter 21. So in chapter 23, one of the blessings that he's forced to utter to the Jewish people is that there is no sorcery amongst Israel. It's an observation that among the Jewish people, this is not part of our nature. We're not into sorcery. Now, aside from the fact that these words sound similar, and aside from the fact that they take place in a very, very small sec section of the Bible, is there a greater significance, a greater commonality between these three words? Let's analyze the first of them. 
Nachash. Nachash is a very fascinating word because you can break up Nachash into two Hebrew words. Nachash can be broken up into the first two letters, Nach, and the last two words, Chash. Nach and Chash. That's a Nachash. What does the word Nach mean in Hebrew? To rest. Nach means to rest. Right? And what does chash mean in Hebrew? It means actually a whole bunch of things. Chushim are feelings. Chashai can mean secretly or quietly. Lachashi means to prayer. Someone who is, uh, has a chashashot is someone that's suspicious. But one of the meanings of chash means to move swiftly. It means to move swiftly. So here we have the snake. The snake lies quietly at rest. The snake lies quietly at rest. But then at the proper moment, it could move very swiftly and strike out at its prey. That's the nature of the snake. It could lie very, very still, nach, and then it could just strike quickly, chash. So what is the nature of the snake? It's a bit sneaky. It's tricky. And in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden story, God says that the snake in the Garden of Eden was the most arum of all the creatures, the most sly, the most sly of all the creatures. And we know the snake in the Garden of Eden is often symbolic of our Yetzir Hara, our evil inclination. Our evil inclination is a very crafty fellow. It's brilliant at allowing us to come up with very, very clever rationalizations to justify very self-destructive or very evil behavior. Meaning, I could end up doing something I would normally never do because this tricky Yetzahara is able to convince me that, you know what, it's not so bad. Actually, you know what, maybe it's even a good thing. Copper, what is copper? Copper is a metal that looks very much like what? Like gold. Copper looks very much like gold. And it was often called fool's gold. Copper was often referred to as fool's gold because many people were fooled into thinking it's really gold, but it's not. It's a much cheaper metal called copper. So just like the snake, is a little bit deceptive and tricky, copper can also have a deceptive element to it. What an appropriate allegory, what an appropriate symbol for a snake, copper. So when God tells Moses to put a copper snake up on this stick, it's almost like a double emphasis that there is deception going on in the world. Not just a snake, but a copper snake. Maybe the message is, look up at this snake. Because what are you being led astray by? Meaning in this story, what were the Jewish people being seduced by? They were being seduced by their appetite for fancy, nice food. They were tired of having the same, what, roast beef again, or what, hamburgers again, what, we have to have that same bread over and over again, meaning that they did not feel satisfied with the diet that God gave them. Even though, by the way, this bread that they were complaining about was miraculous in that it could taste like anything they wanted it to taste like, but it looked the same, and they had to go through the same procedure to get it every day. It was a bit boring. It was a bit boring. And so they were seduced by a desire to have more exotic kind of fare. They wanted to have a more varied menu. They wanted to have a fancier life, maybe. And God is saying to them, you know what? That's a deception of your evil inclination. Look up at that copper snake and realize you're being led astray. You're being tricked 
into going after something that's really of no, no substance, meaning what you need to have in your life is nourishment. You don't need to have fancy looking food. You don't need to have you know, ice cream that has French names to it. Just you can get regular ice cream. It doesn't have to have a fancy Dutch you know, name that you have to spend more money for. And obviously, this is what sorcery is. Nichush, sorcery, is basically deception. It's trickery. It gives us the impression that we might have control over the world. It gives us the impression that maybe we have power that we don't really have. So nichush is deception. Next example, in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, there's a very unusual verse in the Bible. The Torah says, Ve'ata titzaveh, I'm just giving you the first two words here, Ve'ata titzaveh, and you shall command, listen carefully to the words now, God is speaking to Moses, but instead of beginning the sentence, like hundreds and hundreds of other sentences in the Bible, which say, Vayadaber Hashem el Moshe lemor. God spoke unto Moses, saying, and then he gives Moses the command. This is the most common phrase in the entire Bible. Vayadaber Hashem el Moshe lemor. Over and over and over again. This chapter doesn't begin by God addressing Moses. It just says, and you shall command. You shall command. The verse goes on that he should tell the Jewish people to, uh, to, to get pure olive oil and that they should use this pure olive oil in the tabernacle. The rabbis notice that in this portion of the Bible, the portion is called Titzaveh, it's unusual that Moses' name doesn't appear in the entire portion. Now, when you go through the Bible, especially beginning with the book of Exodus, Moses is all over the place, literally all over the place. The whole story is Moses do this, Moses say that, Moses teach this, Moses, 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 all over the place. Here is an entire chapter where Moses' name is not mentioned. And it begins just by saying obliquely about him, without mentioning his name, God tells him, and you shall command the Jewish people. And we know that he's talking to Moses. So the rabbis were very concerned. You mean in this whole chapter, there's no mention of Moses? They find many, many, many clues to his presence. One thing that's fascinating, what was the date that Moses was born? The seventh of Adar. When did Moses die? On the seventh of Adar. This chapter of the Bible is always read on the week that the seventh of Adar falls. So here, the chapter in which Moses' name is not written in the Bible comes out, that chapter comes out on the week that Moses died in the calendar. It's interesting that after Moses, or during Moses' bargaining with God, when God wanted to wipe out the entire Jewish nation, for building and worshiping the golden calf. It was a terrible debacle. Moses doesn't, he wants to plead on the behalf of the Jewish people. And Moses says to God, don't take the Jewish people, don't wipe them out. He says, rather, if you're going to wipe them out, he says, take my name out of your book. He says, na erase me, Moses says, from your book. So many rabbis noticed that this word sifrecha is from, the mem is the prefix from, sefer is book, the chaf at the end is your. So altogether, from your book, which is the Bible. But this last letter, the chaf, is the letter what in the Bible? What is the numerical value of chaf? 20. So they point out, erase me from sifre. Ha, the 20th in your book. Guess what the 20th portion in the five books of Moses is? The 20th portion is this chapter. 
But there are actually clues that show the presence of Moses in this chapter. If we take the name Moshe, Moshe is spelled Mem, Shin, Hey. Three letters in Moses' name. Mem, Shin, Hey. If you spell out the letters, Mem, Shin, Hey, one of the ways that we analyze Hebrew words is we look at the revealed part of the word and we look at the concealed part of the word. We did this last week as well. There's a revealed part of the word, a concealed part. The revealed part of Moshe are the first three letters that we see when we write his name in the Bible, Moshe, Mem, Shin, He. But the concealed part of Moshe are the last parts here that don't appear when you actually write out his name. There's the Mem, Yud, Nun, and Aleph. Let's let, add up those letters. Mem, 40. Yud, 10. Nun, 50. And Aleph is 1 for a total of 101. This portion of the Bible has 101 verses 101 verses in this portion of the Bible. Why is that number significant? Because that's the concealed part of the name of Moses, and he is concealed in this chapter. If you look right behind me, you'll see a diagram of the menorah that was built for the tabernacle in the desert, and they also had the menorah in the temple in Jerusalem. It's different from the Hanukkiah that we light on Hanukkah, which has eight branches and then a ninth for the Shamash. We often mistakenly call the Hanukkiah a menorah. The Hanukkiah is not a menorah. The menorah is the seven-branched vessel that was in the tabernacle and in the temple in Jerusalem. The Bible says in the 25th chapter of Exodus, verse 31, this is the commandment to build the menorah. Vasita, and you shall make menorat zahav tahor, a menorah of pure gold. They were to make a menorah of pure gold. The Midrash, which is the rabbinic explication of the Bible, the Midrash quotes here, a verse from Psalms chapter 119, verse 130. They quote this verse, at least a part of the verse. The Midrash quotes, Petach dvarecha yair. The beginning of your words will be illuminated. So it's interesting. The verse in the Bible says that you shall make a menorah of pure gold. What do the rabbis say about this verse? that the beginning of your words will be illuminated. What do they mean? Why do the rabbis quote that verse from Psalms? What does it have to do with the price of tea in China? What is the connection? How is it telling us anything? So, the commentary has noticed something fascinating. If you count the number of words in the first verse of each of the five books of Moses, again, the beginnings of your words. So each of the five books has a first sentence. The first sentence in the book of Genesis has how many words? We did this already four or five times. There are seven words in the book of Genesis, in the first verse. Seven verses in the book of Genesis, first verse, and they equal the seven branches of the menorah. There are seven words in Genesis 1.1, and there are seven branches, kadim, of the menorah. The book of Exodus, Shemot, the first verse has 11 words. 11 words in the book of Exodus, corresponding to the 11 kaftorim, the 11 knobs on the menorah. The menorah has one of the decorations is called a knob. Then the book of Leviticus, Vayikra, chapter 1, verse 1, has nine words, nine words in Leviticus 1, 1, which correspond 
to the nine prachim, the nine flowers that are on the menorah. The menorah has nine flowers. The book of Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 1 verse 1, has 18 words corresponding to the height of the menorah, which is 18 amot, 18 cubits. And finally, the last of the five books of Moses, Dvarim, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 1, has 22 words corresponding to the 22 cups on the menorah. So what the commentaries point out is that when it says in the book of Exodus that you shall build a golden menorah that's pure gold, and when the Midrash quotes this verse in Psalms which says that this verse in Exodus about the menorah corresponds to the verse in Psalms saying that the opening of your words will enlighten, it's basically telling us that the opening words of each of the five books of Moses has a connection to this menorah which enlightens, which gives off light. And they're connected to different parts of the menorah. This is my crude attempt to uh, make a menorah of sorts. Instead of having seven branches, it has five branches. It's basically a Torah menorah, right? It's a five books of Moses menorah. And this was a very elaborate discovery by Rabbi Weismandel. Rabbi Weismandel was a great hero of the Jewish people uh, during the years before the Holocaust. He ended up building a yeshiva in Mount Kisco, New York, after the Holocaust. But Rabbi Weismandel found incredibly complex patterns in the Torah, again, without the aid of a computer. One of the things he discovered was that the five books of Moses have at equidistant skips of letters the word Torah, the word Torah in Genesis, the word Torah in Exodus, the word Torah in Deuteronomy, and the word Torah in Numbers at exactly 49 letter intervals. In Genesis and Exodus, it begins with the first letter Tuf, the first time the letter Tuf appears, and 49 letters later, above, 49 letters later, Arash, 49 letters later, a letters Ahe. The same with the book of Exodus. At equidistant skips of 49 letters, beginning with the first Tuf in the book of Exodus, the word Torah is encoded. You'll notice that in the books of Deuteronomy and Numbers, it's spelled backwards. It's almost as if it's going in a pattern. So spelling backwards from the letter He and the letter He, the words Torah and Torah are again encoded at 49 letter intervals in each of these books. And then you have God's name of Yud He Vav He, which appears in equidistant letter skips of seven letters in the book of Leviticus. There's actually a lot more that he discovered in this menorah pattern, but I just wanted to whet your appetite. If you want to explore this further, you can do a lot more research. The kind of miraculous things that Rabbi Weismandel found, again, incredible patterns in the Torah. Now for some letters. The letter Kuf, one of my favorite letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Kuf is the letter that corresponds to the number 100. If you take the letter Kuf and you spell it out, Kuf is Kuf Vav Pei, or 186, which is the same numerical value as the word Makom. Makom is place, and it's one of the words that we use to describe God because the rabbis teach us that God is the place of this world, that somehow God is the, the reality that lies at the foundation of the world. So the letter kuf has a connection to godliness when you spell out the word kuf, and even the concealed part of the letter kuf, not the kuf part, but the concealed part, vav pei is 86, which is the value of the word ha'elohim, God. The letter kuf is composed of two letters in the alphabet, a chaf and a vav. Chaf is 20, vav is 6, 
For 26, the numerical value of God's name, yud He vav He. So the rabbis point out that Kuf is the first letter in the word Kadosh, holiness. We mentioned the first week of class that the Bible tells us we should be holy just as God is holy. And I pointed out in that verse, the word you shall be holy is spelt with a, a, the word holiness written deficient, meaning it's written without a vav, whereas the word that says as God is holy, that is written full where it has the vav. What is the relationship between this letter kuf and holiness and godliness? So many of the Hasidic rabbis pointed out, it's an amusing thought, that how do we become holy? We become holy by imitating God. So what is the relationship between the letter kuf and holiness? What is the word in Hebrew for monkey? A kof. So the letter kuf is very much related to the letter to the word kof, which is a monkey. And the Torah's instruction to us is that if we want to become holy, we have to become like monkeys. We have to imitate. We have to ape. It's interesting that the word kof is almost related to the word copy, right? Because the monkey, the kof, copies. It imitates. It does exactly what something else does. Monkey see, monkey do. So one of the paths to holiness is through kofness. It's through monkeyness. It's through imitation. Another path to holiness we can find in the letters that come right after the word kedusha. Kedusha is spelled kuf dalid shin he. Again, kuf dalid shin he. These four letters spell out kedusha, holiness. You take the letters that come right after these letters. After the shin comes a tuf. After the he comes a vav. After the kuf comes a resh. After the dalid comes a he for the word Torah meaning that we're able to acquire holiness by following God's instructions. And the word Torah means instructions. There's one more element that I wanted to point out about this letter Kuf. Kuf is the number 100, which is related conceptually to all of the digits like, a, like 10 and like 1 and 1,000. They're all related because they all reduce down to one. It's another reason, by the way, why kuf is a letter of godliness because we saw that the letter aleph, one, is a letter of godliness. Kuf basically is the number one when you take away all the zeros at the end. Kuf is also related to the word ten because it's that factor of 100. It's factored down to the ten rather than to the hundred. The number 10 in Hebrew is Eser. Eser is 10. But if you rearrange the letters in Eser, you get the word Rasha, which means an evil person. The reason for this is that imitation is positive. But imitation could also be just an external show. So we have a bit of a danger here that we saw that the path to true holiness is when we have true instruction, that's the Torah, but sometimes imitation can be superficial. It can be outward show without any real inner reality. I'll tell you a very amazing story. One of the holiest rabbis of the previous generation was the saintly Satmarov, the Satmar Rebbe, who led a community in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, for many, many years, basically a community of Holocaust survivors that he built into a very thriving community. And he was known as someone who prayed with incredible intensity. He was famous for how intensely he prayed. On Purim, there's a custom on Purim that we, we sort of engage in, uh, in being funny, sometimes in putting on parodies and uh, 
you know, in yeshivot, they'll, they'll put on plays that sort of make fun of the yeshiva and a good sort of sporting nature. Anyway, one year on Purim, there was a badchen, a clown, sort of a, a funny fellow, and he started imitating the way the Satma Rebbe prayed. He was imitating, and it was a very kind of, uh, if you saw his prayers, it was very animated, and it was, he put a lot of emotion into it, and it would almost look peculiar, all the groaning and all the, uh, you know, it was like he was lifting a thousand pounds. So this fellow on Purim started imitating, and the Satma Rebbe was there in the room. He's imitating the Satma Rebbe, and he looks over, and he sees that the Satma Rebbe looks very, very upset. He looks very upset. So this poor Batchen, he, he's, he, he's terrified. He didn't mean to insult the Rebbe. He was just having uh, some fun. He was imitating him. He could even say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. So he went over to the Rebbe, and he apologized profusely. And he says, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to uh, insult you. I hope I, I, I didn't do anything that was wrong. So the Rebbe said to him, let me tell you something. You imitated me perfectly. You got it down a thousand percent. You know why I was upset? Because I said to myself, if you can imitate me so well, maybe I'm just imitating myself. Meaning maybe my, all my prayers, it's not real. Maybe I did it real once. But maybe everything else is just an imitation of that and it's not really real. And the Rebbe was so upset, he was broken hearted because of this. So we have this idea of Kedusha, which takes place through imitation, through copying. But we have to be careful that if it's a superficial copying that's only external, not internal, that's not considered to be proper. I'm just going to make a few short observations about some of these letters. Here we have a series of letters, Sabich 60, Ayin 70, Pei 80. There's a principle in Jewish law that we only rely upon testimony that is eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony is the only valid testimony. So the rabbis found a clue for this in these letters. Ayin is the letter Ayin 70, but also Ayin means an I. Ayin is the I. Samech, lismoch, means to rely upon. So, pe is the letter for mouth. Pe is a mouth. The only pe, meaning the only testimony, the only testimony that we rely upon is that which is seen. We only rely upon testimony that can be seen. There's a tremendous amount that we could speak about in terms of the importance of the mouth, the pet. We won't have a chance to do that together tonight. But one of the things I wanted to share with you, an observation, is something unique about the letter pay. Does anyone see something unique about the letter pay? Yeah, that it's concealing the letter bet inside. Right? You can call the letter bet here an embedded image, an embedded letter. So you have the pay, and the white negative space inside is shaped like the letter bet. And in a Torah scroll, if you watch the pays, that bet will always be there. It's a requirement. Why is it so important to have a bet inside of the pay? There are many, many reasons given. I'll just share one or two with you. One of the things that we're learning here is, again, bet was the letter we learned last week of creation. Bet is the letter of creation. The first word in the Torah that begins with a bet is bara, to create. How is the world created? Through God speaking. So the creation takes place through the pet, if you will, through the expression of the mouth of God. Another lesson that we learn from this is that we should always think twice 
before we speak. The reason the pet, the mouth, has a bet inside of it, it's telling us think twice before you say anything. This should also especially be a word to the wise in the age of the internet, where you post one word, it doesn't just go around the world, it stays in cyberspace forever and ever. It can't go away. You cannot make it go away. You can delete it 400 times, it's still out there. So when we say things with our mouth, the Torah is teaching us to be very, very careful. Think twice before we speak. The word I want to look at now is a word for, in Hebrew, for dream. In Hebrew, dream is halom. Chet, lamed, vav, mem. Those four letters. And I like to look at these four letters and think about the meaning of the letters in the context of the idea of dreaming, of a halom. What is the letter chet all about? Well, chet sounds like the Hebrew word chet, which means sin. But the truth of the matter is, sin is not really a good translation of the word chet. It's more of a, a word that, a translation that Christians could relate to. In Christianity, sin is more of a cosmic event that you cannot really do anything about. You're sort of powerless to overcome sin. I remember once I was listening to a comedy routine by, I forget his name, he was talking about marching with the American flag when he was in the seventh grade, and he dropped the American flag, and he imagined the spirit of George Washington was going to come out and curse him. You dropped the American flag, and somehow you are now tainted and stained for the rest of your life. That's a sin. A sin is something which is cosmic. A sin is cosmic. In Hebrew, chet does not have that connotation. The word chet in Hebrew means to miss the mark, to miss the target. Meaning chet is best translated as a mistake, an error. What do you do about a mistake or an error? You correct your mistake. A sin you can't really correct. So the letter chet has this idea of somehow missing the mark. Chet, the idea of missing the mark. The mystics tell us that chet being the eighth letter, chet is the letter of supernatural. Seven is always seen as the, as the number of the natural. The completion of the created physical world is the number seven. But the number eight is going beyond the natural. So eight is always the number of the mystical. Eight is the number of the metaphysical. Eight is the number of the supernatural. So for example, we're told in the book of Psalms that in the era, era of the Messiah, we're going to play an eight-stringed harp. The messianic age is a next level up. It's not this world we're living in. It's going to be a different kind of existence. Circumcision takes place on the eighth day. In seven days, there's just the creation of a little baby, and now on the eighth day, he's elevated into being a Jewish being. So eight is always this number of supernatural, of going beyond the physical. The holiday of Hanukkah is replete with eightness. The code of first words, what's the first time Choshech comes up in the Bible at the beginning of a word. I'm sorry, I gave it away. The, time, the first time the letter Chet comes out at the beginning of a word is the word Choshech, darkness. So now we have three ideas surrounding the letter Chet. We have missing the mark. We have darkness, obscurity. We have transcendence, going beyond the physical. One of the reasons for this is that dreams are never totally accurate. The rabbis teach us that in every dream there is material that's not totally consistent with reality. No dream is 100% consistent with reality. So there's a little bit of vagueness, a little bit of vagueness, darkness, missing the mark of reality, sort of going beyond the natural world in every dream. Then we have the letter Lamed. Lamed, the letter Lamed, Lamed means to teach, to learn. 
So dreams are here for the purpose of teaching us. We're supposed to learn from dreams. Lamed is the tallest letter. Interesting, by the way, it has a chaf again, a chaf and a vav, 26. So this is not just SAT kind of knowledge. This is divine wisdom. So it starts way up, and the wisdom comes down. So Lamed is usually not just learning anything, like learning how to drive. Lamed is spiritual wisdom that we learn and we study. The letter Vav we've studied once before. Vav is the letter for the conjunction. Vav is the word in Hebrew, and. So ani, I, the, ata, and you. V, and. Vav means in Hebrew a hook. We discussed this, I believe, the first week. Vav means a hook because it's shaped like a hook. The first time this word appears at the beginning of a word in the Bible is in the phrase vave ha'amudim, the hooks of the columns that held up the walls of the tabernacle. So you have this idea of vav meaning to connect us to to combine things, to connect us, to attach ourselves to. And finally, we have the letter Mem. The letter Mem. Mem also, by the way, 26. A chaf and a vav. 20 and 6. There's something very spiritual about many of these letters. So what is it that we're supposed to learn from dreams? And what is it that dreams are to teach us? And what is it that the sort of mysterious, transcendental messages that are hidden with inside dreams, what are we supposed to connect ourselves to? So Mem in Hebrew is an incredible letter. Mem is in the middle of the alphabet. It's right in the middle of the alphabet. So it has this sense of being a bridge. The Mem is a bridge. The Mem is the letter of transformation. Let's look at a few examples. Mem is the number 40. Mem, the letter Mem is the number 40. How long did the flood in the days of Noah last? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So Noah's flood was 40 days and 40 nights. And then, how long was Moses on top of Mount Sinai for Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah? Moses is on top of Mount Sinai for 40 days. And then how long are the Jewish people in the Midbar, the desert? They are there for 40 years. And then, a court will administer how many lashes to someone for punishment? 40 makot, 40 lashes. And when a person becomes ritually unclean, ritually impure, and they have to go through a ritual purification, they dunk themselves into a mikvah, which begins with the letter mem. And it's composed of how much water? 40 se'ah of water Coincidental that all of these words begin with a mem. Mem, 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 40. And these are all things that speak about transition, transformation. That the flood basically was there for the purpose of transforming the whole world into no more world basically, but also transforming the nature of the world. After the flood, Human life diminished from the hundreds of years people lived to less than 120 years that people lived. The whole manner of living changed radically after the flood. The giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai was an incredible transformation. Before that, there's no instructions by God to the world, to the Jewish people. The Torah is now the transformation of the world spiritually. The desert experience, those 40 years in the desert, were to transform the Jewish people from people that had a slave mentality to people that were now trained to be followers of God. Makot, the lashes that the court administered, 
were there not just to punish the person that made a mistake or did the wrong thing, it was to transform that person. And again, the mikvah is there to transform someone from being impure to being pure. There are actually other examples. They speak about the fact that for 40 days, actually 39 days, the fetus doesn't really have its sexuality determined. That comes out on the 40th day. And the substance from which the baby is emerging is called the May Emo, the water of its mother, again with a mem. There are many other examples of this number 40 being a transformational number, a transitional letter. So dreams, a halom, is something that is taking place usually in the dark. We're usually in the dark in terms of what it means. A little bit fuzzy. It's not totally clear. It's coming from a supernatural place. The rabbis teach us that dreams contain an element of prophecy. There's an element of prophecy in dreams. They're for the purpose of teaching us and for us to learn and ultimately to transform us. This is the story in Genesis where Joseph has his dreams. And we're told that in verse 5, if you want to read the English, Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Listen to the dream I had, he said to them. We were binding sheaves in the field when my sheaf suddenly stood up erect. Your sheaves formed a circle around my sheaf and bowed down to it. Not the kind of dream that's going to get his brothers all excited and happy. But then he says... Do you want to be our king? Retorted the brothers. Do you intend to rule over us? And because of his dreams and words, they hated him even more. But then in verse 9, Joseph had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. I just had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. Now who might the sun and the moon and the eleven stars be referring to? Well, he had 11 siblings. And the, star, the sun and the moon might be his mother and father. So here he has a dream where it sounds like he believes that his parents and his siblings will all bow down to him. In verse 10, when he told it to his father and brothers, his father scolded him and said, What kind of a dream did you have? Do you want me, your mother, and your brothers to come and prostrate ourselves on the ground to you? And what was really bothering Jacob was not just the chutzpah of the dream, but how was, Jake, how was Joseph's mother going to bow down to him when Joseph's mother, Rachel, had already died? If you look on the very bottom here, it's got a square of block around the letters in Hebrew, that little rectangle surrounds the letters which read, Rachel Meta, Rachel has died. It's not what the words actually say, but when you combine the words, you have again embedded here, right in this story, which Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob is protesting and saying, this dream that you dreamed Right here on the words that you dreamed, you have embedded the letters Rachel Meta. Rachel is dead. How is she going to bow down to you? And if you look at Rashi's commentary on the right-hand side, Rashi says on the phrase, shall we indeed come and prostrate ourselves on the ground to you? Jacob was saying to Joseph, isn't your mother long since dead? How can your dream possibly come true? Jacob, however, did not know that the statement really alluded to Bilhah, one of the handmaidens who had brought up Joseph as though she were his own mother. And if you look in the text here, in the circled letter, the bet, which comes right after the phrase that Rachel died, if you begin with that bet and you go back 156 letters, you get a lamed. From that lamed, 156 letters, you get a hay. From that hay, another 156 letters, you get another hay. It spells out Bilha, which was the handmaiden of Rachel. 
So here you have an example of what they refer to as Bible codes. There are things that are encoded in the Bible at discrete intervals of letters. Every 80 letters, every 120 letters. If you turn the page over, you have, I'm sure many of you have seen this, but for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, this is something that's totally mind-blowing. On Purim, we read what is referred to as the Scroll of Esther. The Scroll of Esther in Hebrew is called Migilat Esther. Listen very carefully to the words. Scroll, Migilat, Esther, the name of the heroine. But what else does Esther mean in Hebrew? Hidden, concealed. What is the word Megaleh? mean in Hebrew? It means to reveal. So Megillat Esther is not just the scroll of Esther, it means the revealing of that which is hidden. That's what the name of the book is, the revealing of that which is concealed. What is concealed in the scroll of Esther? It's a book in which God's name never appears. The name of God is not present in the book because it seems that his presence is hidden in the story. There are no supernatural miracles. The entire Purim salvation takes place because it seems there are a lot of lucky breaks. The king just happens, can't sleep one night. And when he decides to write down something in the, in the book, he just happens to open it at the right time. And it's almost like a Marx Brothers movie where people just happen to walk in the door at the right moment. It's a book which seems to be a book of incredible good luck and coincidences and good timing. And a person might walk out of this book thinking, boy, those Jews are really lucky. They're really lucky. And the book is saying, no, the whole book is here to reveal that which is hidden. Towards the end of the book, we have a strange passage because, as you'll see, it's written differently than the rest of the book. The rest of the book is written as a block of print. Every line is written a complete line. Here you have two columns of words. This is the passage in the book of Esther which describes the execution, the hanging of Haman's ten sons. Haman was the tyrant that wanted to annihilate all of the Jewish people. So at this part of the Megillah, it speaks about these ten sons of Haman being hung. And then, towards the bottom of the page, it's not over here, but you have it on the sheet in front of you, Esther asks the king, Esther says, Vatomer Esther im ahamelech, if it pleases the king, the rabbis tell us that whenever the Megillah speaks about the king, it could be a reference not just to the king Ahasuerus, but to the king, the real king. So what is she asking the king here? She says, if it's pleasing to the king, she says, let me have permission, she says, to hang the ten sons of Haman. Isn't that peculiar? They just described how they were hung. What do you mean she's going to ask permission to hang them? It's a very strange story. If you read a Megillah, you'll see that when it lists the ten sons of Haman, three of the letters are written small. They're written smaller than all the other letters. The Taf in Parshandasa, the Shin in Parmashasa, and the Zion in Vaisasa, these three letters are always written small. Why might that be? Well, the first several weeks of our classes, we learned about the year in Jewish history of Tuf Shin Chet. We learned about the year in Jewish history of Tuf Shin Chet, literally 708. This is Tuf Shin, Tuf Shin Zion. What might it be alluding to? 
Well, in the Hebrew calendar, the year Tafshin Zion, you should know, by the way, that Hebrew years and English years overlap by a number of months. Right? The English calendar begins in January. The Hebrew calendar doesn't begin in January. The year begins usually four or five months earlier in September. So that year, Tuf Shin Zion, was the year 1946, at least in the autumn. Something amazing happened that year on the Jewish holiday of Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana Rabbah is the last day of Sukkot. It's the day on which the rabbis tell us God judges the entire world, not the Jewish people. On that day, 10 Nazis were hung. 10 Nazis were hung. When Esther is asking permission to hang the 10 sons of Haman, the 10 actual sons of Haman were already hung. Maybe she's asking that in the year 1946, there will be the hanging of 10 sons of Haman. One of these people who was hung was named Julius Streicher. Julius Streicher ascended the gallows. You can read this in all of the historical accounts, it's reported in Newsweek magazine, that just before he had the noose put on his neck, he screamed out, Purim Fest 1946. He screamed out, Purim Fest 1946. The Nazis studied Judaism very carefully. The Nazis wanted to know who they were dealing with. Streicher knew this Jewish holiday quite well. He knew what happened to the sons of Haman. And as he's about to be hung, he understands that this is an echo of that holiday that took place many, many, many years earlier. Just one more thing I'll just include, just for interesting sake. Haman had ten sons, but he also had a daughter. What happened to his daughter? So the Midrash tells us that the daughter jumped out of a window and killed herself. Because the daughter of Haman thought that what was going to happen was that her father was going to be promoted to becoming a much higher official. And she thought that Mordechai was going to have to lead him around on a horse. That was what she thought. And she was waiting by the window of her palace with the pail from her bathroom to dump all the bathroom waste onto Mordechai's head. And here she sees a man leading someone else on a horse. And she assumes that the person on the horse is her father. And the person leading the horse is Mordechai. It was the other way around. Her father was leading Mordechai. She dumps the bathroom garbage onto her father's head. She looks down and sees what happened. And she kills herself. There was an 11th Nazi that wasn't hung in 1946 because he committed suicide in his jail cell. There is a rumor, by the way, that he was a cross-dresser, not just a regular dressing guy, but someone who liked to dress up as a woman. So strangely, many, many years after the Purim episode, where Haman's ten sons are hanged and his daughter commits suicide, ten of the descendants of Haman are hung in a Purim fest, and the 11th commits suicide just as Amon's daughter committed suicide.